Um, so uh, let me just give you a quick introduction of who, who, uh, who we've got up here. So first I'm going to introduce uh, Patrick. So Patrick is the co-founder and CTO of Clover. Uh, his focus is on building secure software that isn't less usable because it's secure and believes the same is possible for decentralized software. Uh, previously, Patrick was the head of development for JP Morgan's blockchain projects, including Quorum, and sat on JP Morgan's firm-wide cryptography board. He's a visiting researcher at Cornell University via IC3, a leading consortium of researchers looking at solving challenges to blockchain adoption. Before that, he was a security researcher and early contributor to the Go programming language. Let's have a big round of applause for Patrick. Welcome, Patrick. <laughs> It's, it's not OCaml, but it'll have to do. So that's OK. I'll get at least three or four fish and OCaml references in before the end of the night. So uh, Dan, I'd like to introduce next. Uh, Dan co-founded Trail of Bits in 2012 to address software security challenges with cutting edge research. In his tenure as CEO, Dan has grown the team to 40 engineers, led their work on the DARPA Cyber Grand Challenge, built an industry-leading blockchain security practice, and refined open source tools in the endpoint security market. Or, by the way, go open source. <laughs> uh, in addition to his work at Trail of Bits, Dan serves as a director at Hack Secure, an investment syndicate focused on seed stage cybersecurity firms. He's active on the board of four early stage technology companies. Dan contributes to cybersecurity policy papers from RAND, CNAS, and Harvard. He runs Empire Hacking, a 1,000 member meetup group on NYC area cybersecurity professionals. His latest hobby uh, is the uh, Algo VPN project. It's the internet's most recommended self-hosted VPN. In prior roles, Dan taught a capstone course on software exploit exploitation at NYU as a faculty member and the hacker in residence. Consulted at ISEC Partners, now the NCC group and worked as an incident response analyst for the Federal Reserve System. Dan holds a uh, bachelor's in science in computer science from NYU Tandon. Welcome, Dan. Thanks. <laughs> so maybe, uh, starting with Patrick, just maybe a little bit of framing of, the, of what you see as the lay of the land for our conversation, and then Dan, and then um, we'll start to get into some of the conversation here. So maybe a couple words. Yeah. So. Um I mean, we're here today as part of uh, the Decentralized Ecosystem Growth Group of uh, Finos. And uh, Decentralized, de de uh, okay, <laughs> am I going to have to shout or? Uh, yeah, here, here, here. If, if, if it doesn't work, we'll. Oh, did you press on? You pressed Hello? The Hello? Oh, that's better. Oh, there, there you go. go. Okay. All right. Cool. Um, it's OK. Okay. So we're here as the Decentralized Ecosystem Growth Group, uh, and that, does, uh, that is a specifically chosen word, decentralized. It's not the blockchain group. Decentralized means a lot of different things, and it spans back uh, over 30 years. And we're in kind of a, a funny period where it's suddenly really interesting again, but a lot of the things that we're talking about have existed uh, for a long time. But we have a chance uh, to kind of bring it back to life and use some of these tools that were never really used but should have been. Um, and yeah, so it'd be, it's going to be exciting to talk about what some of those are and uh, yeah, how it's not just uh, do the blockchain. <laughs> cool. Uh, can people hear me or is this yes? yes. Okay, great. Uh, yeah, so I'm happy to be here. Um, I wanted to, so it's, it's a really core value of Trail of Bits to share the knowledge that we have. I don't think that um, anybody can survive in this uh, industry unless we all work together to try and solve these incredible security challenges in front of us. We're in uncharted water in many ways, but in others, uh, we're dealing with the same problems all over again. Um, I think Patrick and I are both going to explain ways that uh, the current challenges we're trying to solve in blockchain security are highly related to uh, other industries and problem sets that we're very familiar with. Um, so uh, as a business, I'm also ha happy to hear that the FinOS folks are invested in open source. Um, I am too. Uh, there's a lot of ways that I get value out of uh, using and publishing and building community around tools and code that I write um, that I think makes my business better, that makes our clients better, uh, and that makes the internet better. And I don't think there's any kind of mutual exclusivity between, let's say, making money and uh, sharing what you know. Um, so. Uh, happy to be here. Great. So uh, just to dig right in. So 
Um, so Patrick and Dan, you were talking about how when we think about decentralized, we so often think of it as being, or right now, at least the, sometimes in the media, we think of it as being blockchain. But you were talking, you alluded to the fact that there's all sorts of decentralized technologies, maybe not even new technologies. What are some examples of some other decentralized technologies that um, are out there, either new or, or old, that we should be thinking about? Yeah, so uh, I mean, blockchain is the, is the one that is by far the most hyped right now. And it does, uh, there are some new properties about proof of work and uh, you know, a few other of the primitives that are employed in this umbrella term that is blockchain. Uh, but there are, you know, there are many forms of uh, decentralized technology and some are more subtle than others. So like you mentioned, uh, um, the Go programming language, its package manager is fully decentralized, but they don't advertise that. It's not a selling point. It just happens to be decentralized. There's no central NPM kind of equivalent for Go. Rather, it just looks up the package from whatever your import path, your GitHub repository, or your Bitbucket, or whatever. It finds that and pulls it back, and nobody's collecting the information. And it's just kind of a passive side effect of how the system was designed. And that's kind of uh, uh, how we see uh, decentralized technology being successful, is when it's just kind of a property that's not the basic selling point. If you're trying to sell it to people because they want a decentralized thing, it's, it's not going to work. Uh, so that's one example. And then there are a bunch of different systems that have, uh, I mean, obviously Go is designed by kind of a semi-decentralized group. Uh, and there's, it's really a spectrum, and it can apply to different parts of the thing that you're building. Uh, so an example is Let's Encrypt. That's fully centralized at the point of having the kind of God certificate that signs things. And uh, there is one server in the world, there are a couple servers, that runs and signs these uh, certificates to give you these certificates, but it decentralized a huge portion of the CA system. And there's something like um, certificate transparency, again, uh, a PKI uh, tool that was a response to uh, several data breaches and mal, uh, mal, uh, you know, uh, maliciously issued certificates whereby uh, people can be the, uh, the single kind of God users and authors of their data feeds in those prove I signed this certificate at this time, I issued this at this time, sign that and produce a Merkle tree, which is the basic data structure used in a blockchain, and have people be able to fetch that and sync it and, uh, and verify without it being kind of a centralized uh, system where, where everything has to go in the same feed. And that is weirdly centralized at each point of, of issue, but also decentralized because it's about this, uh, this uh, plurality of uh, parties that each makes their own feed. Um, so yeah, there's a, there's a bunch of different things like this, and obviously BitTorrent is an example of a hugely popular technology that's also uh, fully decentralized, but has nothing to do with cryptocurrency, or at least didn't until it was sold to Tron, but that's another, uh, <laughs> uh, another issue. Dan, do you have any other examples of things that, when you think of decentralized, that you kind of jump to mind? Or? Uh, well, I did want to just follow on what Patrick said about certificate authorities. So I think certificate authorities is a great kind of mental um, image to use uh, when you're thinking about challenges trying to solve, tr trying to solve challenges in the blockchain security space. Um, like before cryptocurrency was around, um, you know, if you stored real currency, you went to the bank. You weren't storing money under your, your pillows at your house and uh, trying to hide it from attackers on your own that were breaking into your apartment. Um, but today, every single one of us is much more responsible for the security of the currency that we own. And there's this push to custody your own assets and be individually responsible for the security of them. Um, so that kind of uh, mode of operation is, kind of mimics a lot of the challenges that certificate authorities need to solve for themselves where they have an asset that has an ultimate level of security, a private key that um, signs certificates for the entire uh, SSL system. Um, and they need to protect that with their lives since even a single failure is usually an uncontrolled uh, you know, downside where um, you can mint certificates for any website on the internet. Um, so I think we'll be revisiting that point a yeah. couple of times as we go further on through the night uh, since the problems certificate authorities have to solve are in many ways identical to the ones that we now as individuals have to solve to protect our own cryptocurrency. Yeah, Got basically it. we have to commoditize all the technology that goes into running a certificate authority. Pretty much. Yeah. So does this mean that we're all effectively uh, a form of information security pr providers and professionals? I mean, are we all de facto, you know, whatever we're doing, whether it be 
you know, working with uh, public cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, um, smart contracts? So it, it, have we all sort of, whether we want to or not, become information security professionals? Should I be dusting off my old CISA certification? <laughs> Uh, I'm not sure that the old CISA certification is going to help you, but... Really? Uh, we're, we're not securing uh, NT servers? <laughs> yeah, 3.1 uh, for work groups. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, um, it is... Uh, sorry, what was, the, what was the question? Are we, just, all, are we, are we all IT um, security professionals sorry, now? Um, we have to be that... Yeah, it's, I mean, to, to some extent that was always the case, right? We were all, always building software that has um, potential to have vulnerabilities. It was just kind of, you're always able to kind of move the risk away and not worry as much, like that cyber's problem and that's, uh, they'll run black dock on that and it'll be fine. Uh, but now that we're developing, uh, it's just never been this directly connected to risk. Uh, that we're building software where a bug could really cause uh, the direct loss of money. And because of the way these systems are designed, like the entire point is that you should not have an escape hatch where you can say something bad happened, roll back and, and start over. Uh, and so- You can't just hard fork everything and- <laughs> I mean, depending on how large your institution is, uh, yep. you could maybe do a 51% attack, but you wouldn't be very popular afterwards. Right. <laughs> yeah, I think part of the way, the one of the reasons why this field is so exciting to me is because the risk is so high. Um, as a security professional, I gravitate towards the most challenging problems I can solve. And in this case of commodify, uh, commoditizing all of the security procedures and security techniques that a certificate authority uses to protect themselves and make that available to the entire world to then custody their own assets, their own crypto assets, is an incredible challenge. Um, so, uh, you know, this, this is fun for me, scary for everyone else. <laughs> um, but that's the nature of the game today. So it seems like one of the hardest challenges would be for a bank to have to secure uh, you know, publicly traded tokens in particular. Is there anything, have you looked at any of the security involving that? Um, when you think about exchanges, are there any sort of things that you have to think about? What about security operations? Anything in particular that you know, either of you are seeing, maybe Dan, what you're seeing sure. from the trail bits perspective? Yeah, let's break this down to its concrete parts first. Uh, so what we're talking about here when you want to custody a crypto asset is um, you've got these transactions. Uh, so the transfer of money between one account to another account um, is intermediated by signing that transaction with a private key from the sender. Um, and the problem or the challenge, really, of, of using a lot of these systems is that that private key must be available on the internet for this globally distributed blockchain to work. Uh, that's typically not true for many other systems. Um, so what people end up having to do is protect that private key with a variety of ways um, to uh, you know, keep it hidden. Because um, even access to it for an instant uh, means that somebody can steal all of the value of your account. Uh, so the first thing people do is they create these hot and cold kind of custody systems where you only take a percentage of your assets and keep those on an online system. And then the online system has access to an offline system where the rest of the value gets stored. Sometimes that's through a typical computer, uh, like a set of HSMs, a couple of servers. Other times people use a hardware cryptocurrency wallet, like a, a ledger or um, who, you know, m many of the other product vendors in that space. But the fact remains that that online system still has access to the offline system. And there's a variety of ways to bridge that gap. Um, you know, there are server compromises that happen quite frequently that breach access to that offline system behind it. Um, there's USB removable media that can have security issues, both in terms of the kernel drivers on the operating systems that actually uh, uh, enable those devices, or just malware on the device itself inside the file system. Uh, there's an authentication problem here because you need to prove to that offline system, the, the cold one, that you're actually the right person in order to request the money. Um, so now you have to have security procedures and uh, some kind of authentication authorization. Um, so what ends up naturally occurring next is you make these uh, multi-party consensus uh, systems where you split the keys up and make sure no single person is in control. Um, and once you've got that, you start involving third parties sometimes. People use third party authentication providers. Uh, BitGo is a good example. Um, or you have a large support organization that then has to answer phone calls and send out one-time passwords via email or use RSA tokens or TOTP authentication. Um, so it all kind of just spirals out of control from here. Um, 
So really, like doing custody right is a significantly challenging problem that today in 2019, very few people are prepared to do. Is it, is it really just people or is, there, is it organizations? Is there anything about organizational structures that you see? You know, we talk a lot in FinOS about what is it that organizationally has to change at a large investment bank to embrace open source in terms of cryptocurrency custody? Is there, are you seeing things that are actually having to happen in terms of organizational structures in order to, to embrace this new world? Yeah, so if you're a bank and you're trying to do custody correctly, um, there's a couple of different teams of people you're gonna need in order to pull it off well. Um, you're probably gonna need some kind of strategic uh, engineering organization that can build these systems. Um, you're gonna need application security, you're gonna need uh, software engineering, um, you're gonna need some kind of compliance function, uh, and then you're gonna need operations. Um, there's gonna be an aspect of physical security, of security monitoring, and then user safety, user trust. Um, since at the end of the day, especially if you're in kind of a retail business, uh, users authenticate to you somehow, um, and those users are going to lose control of their accounts frequently. Um, a lot of the attacks that we see on custody systems today aren't necessarily targeted towards the infrastructure that you own as much as they are targeted towards your individual users. Things like SIM porting attacks, stealing API tokens, um, using shared password databases. Uh, there's a variety of ways that people lose access to their accounts. Um, and all of those, like if, if, if you're a bank, uh, you're gonna need to have some kind of fallback that enables the right people to get access to those accounts and not the wrong ones. So it almost sound like phishing attacks. That's reference one, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so to shift gears for a second from uh, scary public tokens and uh, all of, you know, sort of the, the, a lot of the focus uh, around cryptocurrency, Patrick, I know you've been thinking a lot about the changing landscape of data risk for big companies of any industry, not just financial services. Um, what does that have to do with any of this and kind of what, what's the angle here from just the overall data risk perspective from your, your perspective? Yeah, so, so um, beyond, um, beyond kind of payments and um, monetary use cases for decentralized technologies, uh, what we're seeing kind of uh, people build out is really kind of a data uh, coordination mechanism. And a lot of people harp on um, blockchain use cases saying, why would you ever try to do that? You could just do that with a, with a database. And it's, uh, I think, the most, by far the most popular criticism of, of anything blockchain. And it kind of um, is right in a lot of cases. And it's especially right when it comes to, uh, should I be using a 10-ton kind of uh, full blockchain platform? Or should I just be using something that lets me do kind of a certificate transparency kind of audit log, which something like Trillion does? I doubt many people uh, who have explored blockchain use cases have looked at Trillion, but they could probably satisfy a lot of the use cases that you're considering because it lets you do the kind of use case uh, that I was describing and have multiple participants. Um, but it's it's not uh, it's it's not uh, it's not without merit to have a database that can have multiple writers, and that is essentially what a what a blockchain database is: is a database that allows you to have multiple kind of semi-authoritative writers at any given point. And uh, the basic kind of use case that you need to have before blockchain even begins to be useful is that you don't, you trust each other enough to do something together, but not any farther than that. And that's where kind of permission blockchains are not as useful as using a public blockchain network, but for some use cases, especially ones where you're, uh, you are talking about data within different organizations and you don't want it to live forever, uh, and for, for everyone to be able to retrieve it, um, that could be, be super useful. But beyond that, what the blockchain kind of trend has caused is a, just a rocket surge in funding for distributed systems and um, cryptography research. Yeah. So I, I remember, uh, I think it was Emin Grinsira from, Cor from Cornell uh, who said that uh, regardless of what happens with the term blockchain, what it has caused is uh, just an explosion in uh, funding for research that has caused uh, new kinds of things to be possible that will not go away, uh, yeah. regardless of what happens. And what's different this time around, I mean, obviously, there was a huge decentralization, decentralization push once before, that was the internet itself, and that didn't really work out great. Everything is centralized now. Um, but what's different this time is that we really do have technical primitives that lets us do things differently, especially in the areas of multi-party computation. 
Yeah. Uh, there, it really is possible. And I'm not just talking about like homomorphic encryption, which is still kind of a pipe dream. Uh, but it really is possible to run a fairly um, large amount of algorithms uh, in these kinds of multi-writer, I don't really trust the other person, but I still want to be, get useful data out of, out of something. So my, I, I was shared this with you before, Patrick. My, my grandfather was a cryptographer for the Enigma project during World War II, um, and then subsequently was working in the NSA on cryptography. It seems like the state of the art now is M of N consensus with uh, Shamir secret sharing. Is that sort of where you see the, is that the state of the art, or is that the state of the art for March of 2019? Do you, do you see that starting to go in a different direction, or is that going to be it for now? I mean, that's, that's kind of uh, early 2000, uh, late 90s uh, cryptography. Oh, so I'm, I'm already, uh, it's like, <laughs> like me liking fish, right? I'm already. Like, yes. um, I mean, I think most people here in here would, know, would be familiar with things like public key cryptography and PGP and like SSH. And these were all like the most advanced uses of cryptography back about 10, 15 years ago. But the explosion in research and funding in specifically the field of cryptography because of things like cryptocurrency has resulted in some real advances in things like multi-party computation, zero-knowledge proofs, yeah. um, threshold cryptography. Like These are interesting fields that haven't had a lot of interest or a lot of work done um, that are now all of a sudden really important and have actual use cases. Uh, and, and Shamir's secret sharing, to your point, is it's something that's been around for a while, but nobody uses it. <laughs> and that's one of those examples of uh, one of the terms that goes under this umbrella of you know, post-2008 yeah, uh, crypto. It's developed in 1979 or 78, like it's been around for a long time. Yeah, right it's, it's uh, not a new thing, oh, but we have a chance now to make it actually be, be used in a, in, a, in a form where it's usable by a normal person and not just somebody with deep expertise who can, who can afford to hire a team of cryptographers to work <laughs> on custody for them, for example. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> So do my best to share. So speaking of, uh, of uh, technologists and uh, large teams, so the other thing that uh, you know, we've been hearing about is quantum computing and, and the potential existential threat that uh, quantum computing presents to uh, blockchain technologies and cryptography. Um, <coughs> any observations or thoughts like how existential a threat is, is uh, quantum computing going to be? Is that something we're going to see in the next Two years, five years, ten years? Are we going to be? Is climate change going to be the more immediate problem than, <laughs> than quantum computing? Um, so I have I have kind of a personal pet peeve with uh, with the quantum computing hype. Uh, I think quantum computers are extremely exciting in that they allow us to solve classes of problems with different kinds of complexity bounds, and that's that's for all kinds of algorithms, not just cryptography. Uh, it we can. Uh, do things much more efficiently than we could before, including reversing the inputs uh, to a cryptographic function. But, um, and when you talk about something like a, a blockchain, where uh, if it's uh, globally distributed and data is available publicly, then it is a concern if you, you're just encrypting with, with today's uh, methods the data that you're putting on it. Uh, if quantum computers uh, become real, then somebody may be able to reverse that in the future. And so there's a reason not to share your data with everyone, even though it's, it's encrypted. Um, but at the same time, I think that the threat is, is totally overblown in the sense that um, people say that when quantum computers come around, everything is just going to break. It's going to be hilarious. The whole world's going to uh, be set on fire, basically. Uh, but I see it as much more of a Y2K. Uh, yeah. problem. Uh, there happened. really was a Y2K problem. Right. It wasn't one of those like, oh, this is, this is going to be bad and then nothing happened. No, there was a huge response that happened that caused there to be no problems. And uh, we're not currently at a stage where anyone has anything that resembles a, a real quantum computer. Like everything you see in the news about somebody having a quantum computer is a quantum annealing machine, yeah. which is quite different from a quantum computer, which can run two algorithms that are particularly relevant for cryptography, Shor's algorithm and Grover's algorithm. And they allow you to break AES uh, hash functions and RSA uh, cryptography um, much, much more efficiently than, um, than regular computers. I think uh, Dan Bernstein did a talk with Tanya Lange on how big your RSA key would need to be to be resistant to a quantum computer. And it was something like, I don't know, two terabyte private key. It was a, it was a large, uh, very large number, but it's possible. And the point is the work is happening in the space. 
to, to make a kind of post-quantum resistant suite. So when, that's, when this becomes an issue, we switch over. It's like any other issue where a cipher becomes uh, obsolete. We switch over, and now that's the thing we sign with, and it's not an issue. Uh, yes, somebody could forge uh, an, or, or, or kind of um, cause an old signature to be made, but it doesn't matter if we agreed we're switching over to this new algorithm. Right. So I think the threat is, is uh, a little bit overblown. It's, it should be uh, not so much a terror thing as it is an exciting thing for, for what we might be able to do. Just to add my two cents there, I am in total agreement with Patrick on this. As a security professional working in the space that employs a cryptography team, the threat of quantum computers impacting the cryptography that we use is a lot less than what people claim. Um, there are competitions ongoing. NIST has one right now. We'll develop a post-quantum suite of cryptographic algorithms. If you want to see the authoritative write-up on the effect of things like Shor's algorithm on existing crypto uh, suites, as well as the status of a lot of the competitors in that challenge, you can read a blog on the Trail of Bits blog where we walk through uh, our introduction to post-quantum cryptography. Um, so if anybody That's claims to you that there is uh, like any kind of downside or negative uh, impact on the near-term horizon related to quantum computers, take it with a grain of salt. Uh, they, they are probably a lot more ambitious than I, I think a realist would be um, and an expert in the field would be. Cool. So kind of bring this back to open source. So um, it sounds like everything that we've talked about is all these things are going to be mission critical, whether it's our, our investment banking members, our um, data provider members, organization like Moody's, one of our tech members like GitHub or Red Hat. Um, all this stuff is going to be mission critical. So if these tools are so mission critical and doing such critical and sensitive work, um, how, do you, how do we also embrace open source? How do you sort of resolve doing all of this sort of in the open, uh, making the code available, um, and developing these really mission critical tools uh, as open source projects? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, so th there's a couple of things to note here. People in this industry, th th there's, a, there's a kind of a commons challenge where um, if there's any one person operating in the blockchain space that has a spectacular failure, it impacts everyone else. Um, I really don't think that we want random companies exploding uh, from time to time that are using blockchain technology or that are using distributed ledgers or that are using this kind of advanced technology. I would much more prefer if people competed based on the, the value their business provides than uh, their you know, ability to hire me. <laughs> um, so uh, there's this foundational nature to it where I don't really see a good reason why it should be kept secret. Um, from my side, from, from a trail of bits kind of uh, profit and like um, business standpoint, um, a lot of what we do focuses on software security, not necessarily custody security, although we help with that too. Um, and I can, I can actually give a little tangent here. So in terms of research techniques that haven't seen a lot of use, but that are now all of a sudden critically important and apply perfectly to blockchain technology, we use one called symbolic execution. Uh, research technique came up with in the 60s. Um, it's a software analysis method that allows you to get very high precision understanding of what a piece of code does. Um, this technique doesn't scale very well. It doesn't work on Internet Explorer, it doesn't work on Microsoft Office, but it works great on a smart contract that's 500 lines long. And the output of using symbolic execution on a smart contract is perfect security. You know that the code you wrote is safe. We use that technique on every single engagement that people come to us for to review their smart contracts. And the overall framework that we use to do it is something that's open source that Trail of Bits maintains. Uh, the fact that it's open source helps us build a community around the tool, make sure that the most people use it that can, and then people still come back to us because they need assistance integrating it and fitting it into their project. Um, we use a particular licensing strategy where we dual license a lot of the code that we write. Um, so that in public, it's usually a GPL or some other GPL derivative. Um, and then privately, we can offer commercial exceptions. Uh, this is a well-battle-tested kind of uh, go-to-market strategy for open source software that reserves a lot of rights from my perspective, but still enables the largest number of people to use the code we write. Um, I think software solutions for custody systems are in a very similar boat. Uh, we've seen Coinbase, uh, Square, and a number of other companies 
release a lot of the reference material they use to build their custody systems, and there is absolutely no reason why you shouldn't look at what they've done critically and consider using it. Because uh, again, I, I, I don't think that's how we want to compete in an ideal world. Uh, we want to do it on the strength of your, your business idea. Um, and uh, this stuff should be more of a community effort. And I think this, this perfectly highlights, I think, one of the most important things in kind of deciding your open source strategy is really identifying what it is that makes sense to open source. And I see a lot of uh, people making the mistake of open sourcing kind of large swaths of uh, kind of a specific product that uh, is not really the kind of um, core infrastructure, if you will, that Dan describes. Uh, a small tool that does something extremely important and powerful that a lot of entities might be able to contribute a little bit to and therefore it's better for everybody else, that makes a lot of sense to be open source because you can't really lose uh, unless, you, <laughs> unless you, your motivating factor is to make other people explode. But that's, uh, that's a, not a great long-term strategy because of the, 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 the multiplying effects of having other people contribute. Now, the opposite end of that is just open sourcing a huge project, having nobody really, a bunch of people starred maybe, but uh, nobody can really understand it without, how, without hiring full-time people to work on it and then uh, maybe contribute a few pieces here and there. But what you really did is just release your whole project for the world. And you can say like it's open source, therefore it's more secure. That's not true unless people are actually looking at it. So that, that fallacy that because there are a lot of eyeballs, it, it must be better, uh, rarely uh, actually bears <coughs> out. Um, so yeah, that the most important thing of your, of your open source strategy should, should be to identify those kind of core components. And often those are things that you end up building as part of building the product. Yeah. And you realize you could abstract some of this out. And this would be useful for all kinds of things but it doesn't give your secret sauce away. Every foundational piece of infrastructure that we write, we open source. That's the way that I, I, I describe it. If it's foundational in nature, if it does nothing on its own, but provides a basic capability to the people that use it, that you then have to customize somehow or integrate somehow, that's a candidate for open sourcing it. Um, so that's what our symbolic execution framework is. That's what our static analysis framework is. So lots of frameworks and lots of one-off tools. Um, yeah, you don't have to just dump a whole product on the internet. That's probably not a good strategy. <laughs> Great. So we're going to take about do five or seven minutes of questions from the audience. Um, where's Aaron Griswold? I just don't see him right now. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll play Phil Donahue then for a second. <laughs> That's an old reference for any of you who are younger than 40. You don't have an idea what I'm talking about, but I can assure you uh, after you see me demonstrate Phil Donahue, you will understand what that is all about. Um, so, uh, if anyone has a question, raise your hand and I'll bring you over the mic. Yes, Sam, <coughs> Sam from Google. If you're going to do Phil Donahue, you have to put the mic right very close to Sam's. You have to do sort of, everyone know, like you have to do this. Okay. <laughs> I was curious if, if the explosion sort of cryptographic research, I think that that you sort of mentioned, has that really affected like foundational building blocks of the internet, like things like the, the, the heartbeat? What about like SSL, open SSH or OpenSSL? But I mean, have you seen any impacts on those sort of foundational tools that have come out of this explosion in decentralized technology? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, maybe not in the way that you're that you're implying, right? The, it's not a downside; it's an upside. Uh, there's a lot more things that are possible now, based on the renewed interest in cryptography in the last five to ten years because of blockchain stuff. Uh, that I think provides enormous opportunity. Uh, for instance, this is not related to blockchain stuff, but something that's brand new is now there are a lot of uh, consumer messaging platforms that are using something called Noise, which is a forward secure cryptographic uh, real-time communication system that lets you chat with your buddy on Facebook Messenger or WhatsApp uh, in a way that a central third party um, uh, can't see. Um, the systems for designing that kind of uh, cryptographic algorithm um, haven't really been super popular in the past, but today it's like the hottest thing in the universe and the IETF is trying to standardize it into something called message layer security or MLS. Um, and I expect to see a race of almost anybody that's offering a chat platform 
integrating tools like that in the future, and we're all going to be better for it. Because the alternative in the past was PGP, and God knows no one in this room uses it. <laughs> um, so like, that's something that I'm really positive about, uh, that I'm looking forward to as, as time goes on, um, where like two, three years ago, I couldn't have imagined it being the case. Um, on the flip side, you've got things like zero-knowledge proofs, uh, massive renewed interest in that because the ability to transact privately on a blockchain is somewhat dependent on this one single research technique named zero-knowledge proofs. Um, but zero-knowledge proofs are just a mechanism by which I have some information I'd like to keep secret, but I want to prove to you that I have it. There's a lot of things that I would like to prove, like maybe the amount of money in my bank account. Um, so that if I'm trying to apply for a loan, I don't have to give you access to every single bank account and every single investment I've ever made. I can do a zero-knowledge proof to tell you that I've got it, and it's math that backs it up. Uh, or if I've got a software vulnerability, let's say, where disclosing it to you would let you go out and abuse it. Um, so instead, I can make a zero-knowledge proof that says, yes, I know how to do the thing I'm claiming, and I'm using this cryptography to, to, to prove to you that I can do it. The reason why zero-knowledge proofs are at all possible in any reasonable amount of computational time today are because of investments that people like the Zcash Foundation have made into math that made them faster. Um, so that kind of stuff is super cool. Right. On the flip side, SSH, SSL, those kind of things, they're pretty much stuck in time. They're going to be the way they are for, for pretty much ever. Um, like They are a finished product. <laughs> And the, the stuff that's coming next that might replace them is really where I'm interested. Yeah, and there's a, there's a great blog post uh, by the Zcash company as well on the, all the work and the research that happened to make their latest upgrade called Sapling uh, produce proofs much, much faster. And that's kind of foundational research into ZK SNARKs. Um, and I think to your point about kind of core internet infrastructure, uh, it's, it's an ironic centralizing element that the, the, the crypto primitives use in noise and, and uh, what's kind of uh, the new hotness uh, in, in, on something like the IETF working group is, is all crypto designed by one person, Daniel <laughs> Bernstein. Yeah. Um, but it, 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 it's, it, that's a trend that's moving away from kind of hardware optimized, all designed by um, all designed by, by uh, entities that people can't um, for whatever reason, there's always an argument that it's not completely trustworthy, and for <coughs> some reason, Daniel Bernstein is just seen by everyone in the world <laughs> as trustworthy. And so, not only that, it's also much faster in software and on embedded devices. So one of the things Google just did um, is to switch the disk encryption algorithm over to something that uses the Dan Bernstein primitives and thereby, thereby saved a, a bunch of uh, power consumption. Uh, so that kind of thing is happening all the time, but that's not directly because of, because of the kind of new renaissance of crypto that happened because of uh, blockchain. Cool. And uh, another project that's interesting yep. in that space is Handshake, uh, to your point about core internet infrastructure. They kind of said DNS is still a hilariously centralized thing. Let's decentralize it. And it's not really blockchain-based. It's just trying to make the DNS system uh, actually live up to the... the the, you know, the D be decentralized. Cool. Um, so I think we'll probably do two more questions before we do that, though. I just wanted to mention, um, so sure. Sam and Alvin uh, from Morgan Stanley over here, Sam from Google, uh, were two of the people who put together our KDB working group and our new data technology. So not necessarily directly related to blockchain, but if you're interested in working KDB, talk to either Alvin or Sam. They're doing some great work around the KDB time series database. Plug. Yeah, so that's a shameless plug. That's right. That's right. Um, uh, so, uh, two more questions. Anybody have a, another question for the for the panel? Alvin. So, yeah, Phil Donahue, you got to put him really uncomfortably close to his face. <laughs> you make it sound so easy to migrate over to whatever the new encryption standard should be, but in banks, anyway, at least more Stanley, I can say that. You know, we have a hygiene program that's like get off the old versions of software so that it's patchable in case of any security vulnerabilities. And some of these programs run for years, literally. So if you're saying, you know, millions or millions of dollars are on the line if you don't switch over, well, like, what kind of software architecture or deployment strategy are you talking about that makes the switch over so easy? Oh, but you're agile now, right? 
It's all fully, it's fully agile on Kubernetes. We're, we're on the record, by the way. Just want to make sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, that's a, that's a great point. I mean, uh, evolution in large enterprises is, is really difficult. And, and uh, uh, one example of that is also TLS 1.3 versus 1.2. There's a lot of um, uh, security software and appliances uh, that work up until TLS 1.2, but after TLS 1.3, it just breaks because the IETF said we won't allow middlemen anymore, and <laughs> that's how those products work. And so there is uh, definitely, I think there's a, a couple of things like this where it's just going to have to be a, a scramble and people are going to have to spend time on it. Uh, but obviously adopting a strategy where you can change your software faster than kind of a 12-month uh, release cycle is a, is a good idea. I think but it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, yeah. For, for post-quantum stuff, you're going to see this coming from a mile away. Like, I, I, am, I am very negative that the physics of a quantum computer are even going to work at all. There's an information yeah, loss that happens as the qubits go up, and I don't think that it's a guarantee that quantum computers are going to be a thing. Um, if they are, uh, the time horizon is pretty long, and the fact that we're standardizing the encryption algorithms today uh, should give people the 20-year head start that makes these things possible to solve. Yeah, to, to the point of quantum computers uh, in particular, I think we'll have a cipher suite where there is a post-quantum choice. And in fact, Google Chrome already tested a fully post-quantum uh, uh, cipher suite construction. Um, and if somebody builds a quantum computer, like Dan said, it's not, it's not for sure. We'll probably know about it. Maybe not, but probably. Uh, <laughs> but it's not for sure that that computer will actually be fast enough to do this. Yes, it's true that it allows you to asymptotically perform the computation much faster, but the computer may be hilariously slow. And so it may take a long time before that quantum computer is actually fast enough to realize that. Yeah. So I, I fully agree with Dan. It's, don't worry about <laughs> quantum <laughs> computers. Yeah, and, and to, just to beat this one more time, like there, there's, there are certain cryptographic algorithms that aren't affected at all by a quantum computer. Like uh, symmetric, key crypt symmetric cryptography in general the only thing you have to do is double the number of bits that you're using. Yep. So if you were using 128-bit AES, now you should use 256, you're done. And same uh, with the SHA-512, if you're using that, you're, you're almost certainly going to be fine in the wake of a quantum computer. It also won't affect random number generation. Uh, random number generation is the exact same thing. You just double the number of random bits that you need, and then you're done. Uh, the, really, the only thing that it affects is public key cryptography, and solutions for those will be available in the next couple of years. I'm yeah. feeling a lot better. Yeah. I really am. Thanks. Um, w let's have one more question, and then Amber's going to come up and uh, give you a little bit of an overview of our program. Uh, who would anyone like to do the honors of the last question? Yes, yeah, stump me. If, if not, <laughs> then uh, yeah, sure, please. Thank you. You're welcome. So I get the impression you feel that uh, blockchain is a bit overhyped. Do you see a decentralized financial ecosystem future without? I think it's perfectly possible, and that's uh, one of the goals of this group, is to compile tools that, when used together, will allow you to actually solve your problem, instead of just say, oh, I accomplished my objectives this year, boss, give me my bonus. Uh, because that, the second thing doesn't really last, but you're always going to have problems that you need to solve. And so we're going to have, uh, hopefully, tools that uh, may leverage a blockchain or may kind of graduate to blockchain when they need to have multiple parties involved, but still solve problems for you as an individual organization, like the kind of audit log example. Okay. I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll avoid answering the question. I got a little bit of a different take on it. So uh, I'll, I'll kind of answer a question on the side. Um, so I think over the last year or two, people have built these very simplistic decentralized applications. They're 500 lines of code long. And uh, they don't do a whole lot. Like, usually they just raise money or they have some kind of proof of concept functionality. Raising money is the most important That's part. That's right? <laughs> the most important part. Um, but you're right. Like, 90% of the companies out there that raised a bunch of money to do decentralized whatever probably didn't need to use any kind of blockchain to accomplish what they wanted to do and probably went out of business when the market started to drop. Uh, but the companies that remain are creating ever more complex decentralized applications that are actually using the technology to its fullest. So this is another area where I'm kind of positive on the future, where as 2019 continues and we go into 2020, I think we're going to see some significantly more advanced uses of decentralized kind of blockchain stuff um, that uh, makes it clear what the value of the tech really is. Yeah, and I'm not anti-blockchain, obviously. I used to work on a platform 
called Quorum, which is an, <laughs> a variant of Ethereum. Uh, I'm just anti using blockchain to get paid. Uh, <laughs> use the blockchain to solve the problem if it's the right solution for your problem, otherwise don't. Uh, and we're going to have uh, in this group pieces that fit every part of that spectrum. But absolutely, it, it's, uh, I, I hate the phrase, it's early days, but it really is. Uh, it's very early in this, uh, in, in the maturity of these kinds of technology stacks, let alone the individual parts. Uh, when it comes to blockchain. Cool. Uh, well, speaking of uh, quorum, uh, we're going to have Amber come up and say a few words. So uh, maybe a round of applause for our distinguished panel. <laughs> <laughs>